Michael, welcome to Fractal Friends. I am really excited to be talking to you today. Oh, it's so good to be with you. Um, yeah, I think it's worth um, mentioning that I, well, I've known you for a bit. You are a close friend of, or your father of a close friend of mine. Um, and we got to meet um, last, uh, last year at a game of people trying to talk about how do we build the future now? Like what do we, how do we practically do that? And you came and you're, um, uh, to bring like a unique perspective because we really wanted to be built, you know, if we're building the future, it has to be a future for everyone. And so not only were you the parents of one of the organizers, but you, um, uh, you're an, um, a minister who's, you know, working in a Christian church and been doing this for a long time. And, um, Obviously, you have a, a long life story, and we'll get into that. Um, and I just want to say that it's been so such a joy to be talking to you. And um, before we get into the story, though, I wanted to know if you'd be willing to um, maybe you could start us off with just a prayer for for this country, for this time, for this conversation. Absolutely, I would love to. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for who you are. We thank you so much for your love for every single person on this planet, Lord. We thank you so much for your grace that you've already poured out in so many ways over so many centuries, God. And we ask right now that that grace would permeate every part of the, uh, particularly the American culture right now, as we're in such a turmoil, there's so much a chaos, there's so much polarization. Father, we ask that you would bring your peace. And we ask that that peace would pervade every single heart, that we would lay down our weapons, lay down our shields, and that we would begin to see each other through your eyes. That each person is beloved of God, and each person is ultimately lovely, to one another. So Father, grant your peace and your blessing on our nation at this time, and also to all the nations of the world, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hmm. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Excellent. Um, yeah. I want to, there's a part there that I want to maybe pick up to start was this laying down the weapons and laying down the shields. Um, there's something that's a real, there's a real gift I'd notice in, um, in you know, spiritually minded folks and specifically in Christianity, and I say that because it's the one I'm most familiar with, um, of being able to sort of hand some things over, you know, like not needing to feel like we need to carry all the weight or all the solutions. <clears throat> um, uh, and I really appreciate that just like, you know, it's the power of just trusting, you know, that something else is kind of holding, you know, and um, that said, I would love for, uh, to hear a little bit about sort of like your journey to find, um, to find Jesus or find Christianity, and just like what that means to you or just like, what does it mean to you? Like kind of in this time, you know? Yeah. I guess that's all the questions at once, but you, you should sure. take it where you want. Yeah. <laughs> no, it has, it has a lot of meaning to me. Um, just uh, so that everybody knows, uh, I was raised in San Francisco, uh, most of that in the Castro district, <laughs> as a um, hippie kid. And so I think my parents got me stoned on marijuana the first time at 11. Um, and this was now probably 1970, probably 70 or actually, yeah, somewhere around that time. I also, uh, you know, took LSD with my parents at, at 13 and probably took LSD 300 times. Um, when I was 13 years old, we started a commune and we had, uh, you know, a large house and we took in probably, you know, at any time, six or seven different guru followers or political activists or draft dodgers, because this was during the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. So I was raised in a, you know, my first spiritual book was uh, uh, DT Suzuki Zen Buddhism. 
you know, after that it was Ram Das, be here now. So I was raised in a very non-Christian environment. I had two rules in my house that you could take any drug you want as long as you don't shoot it. And you could uh, sleep with anybody you want as long as you bring them home. So those were the two <laughs> rules that I had. And uh, so it was definitely during the whole, you know, post summer of love reality in San Francisco. And my parents had bought into it very deeply. And uh, anyway, so that was my world. And uh, I, but I, at about 15 years old, I started hitchhiking. Most summers I would be on the road for the whole summer, hitchhiking to different spiritual communities around, uh, around the, the country and even through Mexico and then into Canada. And so on all those journeys, I started meeting Christians and they started sharing with me and I started arguing with them. And, and uh, you know, I, I had taught, been taught enough by my parents to be given enough ammunition to fight against Christians. But there was one particular day when I was uh, 17 years old, where I was hitchhiking from San Francisco to Mendocino, and I got seven rides in a row with believers. And, it, and every one of them witnessed to me, and every one of them was sincere and beautiful, but I just thought they were a bunch of uh, Neanderthals, spiritually speaking. And, uh, but the final ride I got was with this amazing woman who became my spiritual mother. Her name was Sabina Ball. She picked me up in Boonville and we went for 25 miles. And then at the end of the ride, she said, would you like to pray with me? And I, and I said, yeah, I would. And, and something happened, I, I changed. And you gotta remember, I was a political activist. I was in every anti-war march. In fact, even as a, as a vice president of my school, I would every moratorium day, I would put up the flag upside down and be called into the principal's office and have to go and change it. And, and uh, you know, I was, I was, you know, in most protests, in fact, at one protest on Market Street in San Francisco, um, I literally had to duck because a billy club was aimed right at my head and it smashed the window behind me and I ran. <laughs> and I ran around the corner and went up to uh, Macy's and, and ran into Macy's on, on O'Farrell and uh, literally you know, <laughs> went into the, the restaurant just pretending like I belonged. And, uh, and all of a sudden I saw this army of, of police and tactical gear coming down the road. And I thought, oh no, you know. Anyway, so I, I, I was a hardcore, passionate activist. In fact, oh, for a while we ran our house on Mao Zedong's Red Book. So if we had a dispute with somebody in the house, we would actually consult Mao Zedong's writings at that time to resolve our conflict. So again, I came from a very, very uh, unusual background. And, but at this moment with this woman, I gave my life to Christ. I just said, okay, God, have your way with me. And about two weeks later, I had this very amazing uh, experience, a vision that I had that kind of set me on a course. It was still, you know, probably nobody would have outwardly considered me a Christian at that time because I was still just you know, in this, in the lifestyle. I was in a rock and roll band. I was, uh, you know, had a relationship with two different women. I was doing a lot of drugs still, but something kept changing in my heart until I ended up on a Blackfoot Indian reservation going to the, um, the rainbow gathering. And this was the second rainbow gathering ever. And rainbow was kind of the precursor wow. to, to, uh, to Burning Man. Okay. And, uh, but rainbow gatherings are still going on around the world. Anyway, I met this Indian named Tiny Man Heavy Runner, and he uh, invited me to spend the night with him at his teepee. But it, in the morning, he introduced me to his grandparents, and they were actually followers of Jesus. And they had come to the Lord through a very unusual experience. They had a m manifestation of Jesus in a bar, and everybody in the bar saw him. I mean, so this is this was kind of perfect for me because I, I could have never become a Christian in a normal church, but to hear all these amazing stories and to see miracles, I actually saw some amazing miracles and uh, all of that changed my life. So I, I lived with them for the, the grandparents invited me for six months to live with them. And that was really where I read the Bible finally with an open heart and started to really be transformed. I, I had some, uh, again, more unusual spiritual experiences and then it was at that point that they said, well, we've taken you as far as we can. You need to get trained. So that was my initial sort of journey into becoming a Christian. Mm -hmm. And again, I don't even like to use the word Christian so much because it gets so muddied by all the misrepresentations and also by the failure of many people who call themselves Christian. So I generally refer to myself as a follower of Jesus. Mm -hmm. um, you know, again, I'm not afraid of the word Christian because I think it is a... a 
a, a fine label, but unfortunately, it's been uh, distorted. And so anyway, uh, but that's kind of the, at least the launch of my story. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I really appreciate that. And I just like love the, like going to the rainbow gathering on the Blackfoot Indian reservation and then, and then finding, you know, uh, yeah, finding a path of Jesus with Blackfoot Indians and like, uh, and so, um, yeah, I love how it's like, it was like the perfect setup for where you were coming from, for you to be able to go there. It was like exactly the path that you needed to be able to take to get there. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, I'm interested in, um, cause I think this is like, I think probably could be a relevant theme for us throughout this conversation is like, you know, at some point you were, were there to fight, you know, you had judgment against these Christians and, you, and, um, you wanted to prove them wrong. You thought you knew, um, the hubris of youth, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, you know, and, and then you get to this place where you were able to finally like open the Bible with an open heart and, um, and content aside, I feel like that this question of like wanting to sort of fight against someone that you assume is like not doing it right. Yeah. And then get into the place of like, wait, let me actually listen to what you're saying. Or like, let me actually expose my heart to yeah. something. I'm curious if you have any lessons in that transition there. Yeah, like, gosh. I mean, in this case, I really think it was probably a supernatural grace from God that kind of caused me to lay down my weapons <laughs> because I would fight with Christians all the time. And I, I knew enough about Christianity to fight it. And, and I was very adept at most new age philosophy stuff. So I was practicing yoga and, and Tai Chi at the time. I had studied Lao Tzu very carefully. I, w I was mo more moderately studying uh, Buddhism and Hindu, but then I eventually became actually uh, uh, into Sufi and ultimately into a, a, a belief practice called uh, Subud. And so I was, I was on a journey <laughs> and mm -hmm. uh, and so but I, I was able to articulate the sort of the amalgamation of all those different belief systems to combat Christianity okay so it I think first I would say it was grace that taught my heart to fear as the as amazing grace song says but secondly I would say also that that I realized that I had been um, polarized that I had, and, and part of it was from my parents. They taught me that the Bible was an e book, a book written by an evil king to oppress the masses, and that Christianity was the least evolved religion of all. But I also remember one time, you know, just standing out in a starry night and saying, I'm so frustrated, God, why didn't you make a religion that could change me from the inside out? Because I had all these beliefs and practices, but I didn't feel like I was changing. And so mm -hmm. I was desperate. And, and really, that's actually the, the true message of Christianity. Now, again, Christianity gets loaded with a lot of other garbage, but that was the true message. So anyway, so I think for me, it was recognizing the heart of sincerity mm. in the people that I had stigmatized, the people that I had uh, caricaturized. You know, I had sort of turned them into a, a caricature of something. And that caricature was easy to hate or easy to belittle or easy to mock. Yeah. But the real person wasn't. The real person was a sincere person, even if they were sincerely wrong, <laughs> which I thought most of the time, their sincerity actually won the day for me. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, that's, that's really powerful. You know, um, just like the recognition of the sincerity of the other person. Right. And, um, you know, one of the things that I know that both you and I have a, you know, concern about is like this path of like the way that people are dehumanizing each other. Exactly. And there's a way that you, um, are, have been, you know, and that was part of what your experience was like, a, you know, you mentioned like Neanderthal Christian, you know, thing. And there's like this sense of dehumanizing and, and, and there's that flavor going on in the world right now, you know, and on, I would say in both sides that, you know, I hear people, um, 
I'm always interested by trying to catch like when are people starting to use like derogatory terms to refer to each other. You know, mm -hmm. I, I hear people talk about like social justice warriors or you know racist Republicans or you know people just like these words that people are throwing around um, mean you know as a path of um, you know as a way of dehumanizing each other. And what's really interesting is like a part of what this path that you're, you know, like that your experience, the wisdom of sort of your experience offers here is like, can you recognize the sincerity of the other person? Like, just like that this person actually really does care and right. that they are a real person who's like really trying to do good in this world. And this is like something that they see. And now you might disagree with what they're doing, but at least can you recognize that they are sincere? Yes. Um, yeah. Um, what I really want to lift up out of this is this idea of grace. And there's something about, um, that word has meant a lot to me at different times in my life. And um, yeah, actually, I'm just I'm always wondering like what episode, what song should go with this episode. I might try to pull out some amazing grace because that's a really great one. Um, uh, can you explain to me how you understand grace a little bit? Yeah. Well, grace is the free gift. I mean, that's literally what the word means in its original uh, Greek form, is it's a gift. And, um, but it's a gift that implies something. See, grace, I believe, is divine empowerment to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, grace is a little different from mercy, because mercy is not getting what you do deserve. Okay, grace, on the other hand, is getting something you don't deserve. In the sense that I didn't generate this. This is just given to me apart from anything I did to achieve it. So grace, it, and that's really where I think the, the grace that we are called to extend to one another should be to some extent above and beyond the goodness or the faults that we see in each other. It's, it's, it's a, a, an offering. And, and again, you know, just so your listeners are, are clear, you know, my life for the last 45 years has been built increasingly on what I would call a, a biblical worldview. Right. I, 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 and, and so again, and this is something that we need to understand as we're extending grace to everybody, is that every single person has a worldview. They have a set of experiences that have formed a set of, of uh, uh, lenses that they, that they wear to see the world. And those lenses become uh, the framework by which you organize your responses to life and others. And, and so what I have to battle to do in my uh, personal battle against polarization in my heart is I always need to be able to keep in mind the fact that from a biblical worldview, every single person on this planet is somebody that God loves so much that he sent his son to reach them. Yeah. So it's like for me to hold uh, 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 an animosity towards somebody, to, for me to be isolated or alienated from somebody because they're operating in the context or of their own worldview, puts me down on the, the, the playing field of this for that and tit for tat and so forth. But part of my responsibility in my worldview is to rise above that and to be able to see each other through the eyes of love. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And yeah. also to see each other through the eyes of, of the victimization of a broken world. Right. Yeah. I, there's one of the, after our sort of prep conversation for this interview, one of the take homes for me was um, there's like a real, you know, like there's a real gift that's available here. Because, um, like, the, you know, sort of my worldview is, you know, that like each of these different political perspectives, cultural perspectives, like, has something to offer. And I also am assuming that it probably has a shadow side. Yes. including my own right and that um and that i'm an imperfect person trying to do good you're an imperfect person trying to do good in this world and that's kind of what we all are and um one of the lessons that i was like remembering that's 
that like a like a Christian worldview can offer to this world right now is, yeah, we know you're a sinner. We know that you are flawed, and there is a path to redemption. Right. You, you know, and and actually. You know, someone already did a lot of hustle to be able to give that to you. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and um, and and whether or not, um, you know, whether or not I need like Jesus and Jesus' story to be the the, the answer for that. You know, there is some space right now for just like right. can we have some more spaciousness. We're just recognizing that we're imperfect human beings and that yes, we can be healed. And yes, there is a true goodness in us. And, um, I, you know, my personal discovery of that was or like a, was like a spiritual experience that I had was, um, actually thinking about my ancestors wow. and just thinking about just like, my parents and my grandparents and my great grandparents and my great great grandparents and just like and and as I kept on following that back, um, I go all the way back and it's like an evolution and then the birth of the universe and some star that exploded to make you know this thing and then she's like as I and like I started feeling the weight of that oh, right yeah. right yeah. just like this like it's like how can I ever pay that back I right. can't. Wow. It's just way bigger than I can. But then I when I but then the, the click was wait, this was a gift. Yeah. This is the free gift. Like all of those generations before me and all of the time before me, like was hustling to get so that I can be here and be a free human. And that now I get to give that gift forward. Right? right. Like, how do I show up? And what will my descendants in 10,000 years look back and say um damn they got through the global the right. global turn you know reconstruction of 2020 you know and just like so grateful to yes. <laughs> to them for that and you know and now we're humans you know just all around the universe or whatever whatever that 10,000 year future yeah you know, that actually is the line from Amazing Grace, right? When we've been here for 10,000 years, bright yes. shining as the sun. Yes. Um, you know. No, that's, that's brilliant. And, and I really do appreciate that. I think another line from the song is, you know, I once was lost, now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. And I think um, that also helps us to not stand and throw stones across the fence at the other people mm -hmm. yeah. is because we have to recognize that we all fall short of even our own personal aspirations. <laughs> you know, even the, even if it's not a biblical plumb line, we all have a personal plumb line that we always fall short of, mm, yeah, you know? Right. Yeah. And so if we know how hard it is for each one of us personally to live up to our own ideals, how can we be so angry at the other side of this equation, whatever it is, if it's political or if it's religious or if it's anything else, mm -hmm, how mm -hmm. can we be sitting in the seat of judgment towards one another and condemning one another without, first of all, recognizing that weakness in ourselves. Okay. Yeah. And then the other thing that I think you brought up just a second ago, which is so good, is also the, the recognition that because all of humanity is flawed to some extent, then also all of the structures that we build and all the systems that we have, even our political governments are flawed to the extent that all humanity is flawed. And so the, the expectation that there should be a perfect system Mm -hmm. or a perfect approach to climate change or a perfect approach to, you know, the, the hot button political issues that are driving the day is like, wait a minute, we need to give each other a little bit of mercy here because, and, and so, you know, systemic racism, yeah, it does exist because unfortunately systems are built by humans and humans have flaws. And that doesn't mean we shouldn't strive to improve at every given opportunity. But on the other hand, if you look back 400 years when slavery started, 
the whole world was doing slavery. The Zulus were doing slavery, you know, the Chinese were doing, the Japanese yeah. were doing slavery, the Vikings were doing slavery. So again, to judge 400 years ago and not recognize the progress of humanity is also a, a, a bit of a narrow viewpoint that can aggravate the, the, the polarities mm -hmm. at a level that's just unhelpful. Yeah. So again, we need to kind of be able to just sort of, you know, be able to view, wow, there has been incredible progress from your great, great grandfather's day mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in terms mm -hmm. of the rights of individuals and in terms of recognizing the value of human life and to recognize that all men are, are truly created equal, not just in a document, but we can actually apply that document in greater and greater ways because we are progressing. Yeah. Right. I mean, like just the very fact that we can, you know, look back and say, wow, we used to do things that we really thought were horrible. Like, eat, like, like that's, that's progress, you know, in this yeah. amazing way. And, um, and there's something about not, um, you know, like looking at that past, like, you know, we don't need to, you know, it's, celebrate it but we can celebrate the path that it got to that we got to here exactly. and now here we are and so like let's just you know like a little bit of like celebration like here we are right now this is great and guess what this journey in progress that we get to keep on doing it absolutely um yeah and um and i really appreciate that idea of just like this tone of like perfectionism like it's something that's like feeding into the polarization right just like yes. we're not perfect yet like you know let's get angry about it you know and and it's and um yeah um well and i want to talk about that a minute more but i do want to sort of capture it just because it's such a beautiful like because it's kind of this like up theme right now is like i don't know how many people know this but the song amazing grace is written by um this guy named john john newton i think was his name yes yes you're yeah. correct um and he um was the captain of a slave ship that was traveling across the Atlantic, you know, for many years, then found God and, and then found grace. And, you know, if you just think about the depth of grace, you know, that it takes to, to have someone realize like the horror that they had been contributing to and that they still get to have a path to redemption. I mean, no wonder they wrote this most powerful song because it's like, I mean, that's drop to your knees kind of gratitude, you know? Yeah. <laughs> like, um, it's like if I, if I can be redeemed, then all of us can be redeemed. Absolutely. So um, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, what I want to pick up here, though, is this, like, piece about, like, perfectionism and just, um, you know, like, you know, we're struggling right now around, like, how are we supposed to do things? You know, it's like kind of a question of the day. Like, how do we want this country to be? How do we want to um, reconcile with our history? And um, and how do we want to reconcile with this moment? You know, like, what's going on right now? And um, I think that you and I have some alignment around this idea that, like, we could use a big dose of forgiveness, mm. humility, <laughs> and that, like and then and see like some of the dangers of maybe like righteousness or pride you know of just like that sort of like i'm right and you're wrong kind of attitude yeah. gosh if i could just take anything out of the world it would just be like right and wrong you know it's yeah. like i don't know just like just remember there's a gray gray area here yeah well, can I challenge that for a minute? Because yeah. I think right and wrong is is really a, a natural byproduct of worldview. Yeah. In other words, I hold convictions that I believe other people who hold different convictions are wrong. Mm. I think the difference between is not a difference of right and wrong, but a difference of I'm good, you're bad. Yeah. You know, that in other words, when because I think it's 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 a normal, there's actually two words for judgment in the scripture. And one word for judgment is actually more effectively uh, translated to be discernment. Mm -hmm. And the other one is condemnation. 
Okay, and there's a big difference. Jesus never forbid discernment, but he forbid condemn condemnational judgment. And this is important because when we start to condemn the other side, and we start to, in a sense, condemnation is the removal of any possibility of redemption. You know, you're bad and you will always be bad. And I think that's where the difference between punishment and correction. Correction is discerning a problem and, and making it right. You know, punishment is saying you failed, now you're going to pay the price. And I think that the issue of judgment is really at the root of so much of the polarity. Yeah. Is that each side has judged each other instead of seeing each person's position in the light of their own worldview and then pointing out what you believe are the wrong thoughts, but also at the same time not condemning the person. Right. Yeah, I really... Um... Well, that's really helpful, and um, and it, it makes me just really appreciate. Just like I feel like I get to like have this opportunity right now to like be more precise with my speech, right? Yeah. You know, you know, because right, like I and you, like each of us personally, get to sort of find our own decisions of like right and wrong, right? Yes. Like there are things that I want that are okay for me and not okay for me, right? And then. Um, but the danger becomes when I start making that assumption that 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 I get to apply those to you, because right. you get you're a sovereign being. You get to choose your own path based on your own worldview, your own life experience of like what is right and wrong for you, right? right. And um, but it really becomes a problem if I start thinking that you're good or bad based on your choices of right and wrong. Yeah. Right. That's and like right. and I, yeah, and then I get to like, and then. But then I'll still even do things that are wrong in my own worldview sometimes. Exactly. You know? like, and, and then I have to reconcile with those too. You know? Right. And see, that's the difference also where, you know, sometimes Christians are even rightly um, stigmatized because we also at the same time believe that it's just not a matter of subjective worldview and subjective right and wrong. Mm -hmm. But we believe in a greater objective right or wrong. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, everybody does. Everybody thinks that their worldview is the objective truth by which everything else should be measured. Okay. And that's pretty common across the board, regardless of, you know, how postmodern you are. Most people still, you know, um, think in those terms, even if they've denied all objective reality. Still, ultimately, I think we hold that belief. So the question then from a Christian standpoint is, I do believe that a real God exists. And a real God who exists is, is actually a person. He's a being. He's not a force. You know, because we've all adopted the Star Wars theology. But, <laughs> and, and so that God has a, a, he created all things to be in harmony with one another. And therefore, he has an absolute perspective on what works and what's, what doesn't work for humanity because he created us. And so that's a bunch of presuppositions that I hold with a biblical worldview, that therefore when I see somebody acting in a way that's contrary to God's declared, uh, let's, let's call it his music that he wrote. He mm -hmm. composed a symphony, and we all get to play our part in the symphony, but some of us are out of tune. <laughs> and some of us are playing the same music, but we're playing in a different key. Okay, and then some of us aren't playing the music correctly, and so it's causing disharmony in the universe. And so again, for me, I, I care a lot about the environment and the climate issues, but I care much more about the issues of, 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 of spiritual pollution than I do of the issues of sort of uh, or, organic sort of environmental pollution, even though both are important. You mm -hmm, know what I mean? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, and again, I hold that and I can express that and I can even go into more detail about that. But I also know at the same time that um, the people that are more progressive and are anti-Christian or, you know, opposed to some of the Christian perspectives at this time um, probably hold the same sense of that, that their worldview is the objective truth. Right. 
And so again, that's where the clash becomes even more severe because when you believe that you have that and you're not careful to guard against condemnation, then condemnation of the other becomes the easy way out. Right. Once you dismiss them, once you just dehumanize them, then they become a target that's easy to denigrate. Yeah, right. Yeah, I can. I, yeah, I'd love to unpack this a little bit more because I could. I could picture, um, you know, some folks being like, "Wait a minute, this isn't like the Christians that I grew up with," or "This isn't," you know, like, sure. um, you know, and right, and definitely, um, I would say like both on like a secular left and in the Christians, we can see like plenty of examples of people condemning each other based on what they think is right sure. or wrong. And, and, um, and so, you know, you, the be earlier, you were mentioning that you don't always necessarily call yourself a Christian. You call yourself a follower of Jesus. Um, and, um, and I know that like, you know, like officially like you're, kind of ministry is evangelical ministry, but you don't tend to play around with that. That word also, you know, has been, you know, used in all sorts of different yeah, ways. And exactly. I'm just curious if you can like, if you'd be willing to sort of give us like a little bit of a lay of the land of like, you know, how, you know, I think particularly for, for maybe non-Christians, but just in general, maybe you can speak to Christians here too. Like, yeah, how do we make sense of just like, there's so, I mean, Christianity obviously has gone so many different paths and there's so many different approaches here. And some of them are louder voices, you know, um, than others. And, and um, what do we do with that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, like you said, there's so many different variations. And again, I love the fact that there can be, because I think there gives us that ability to be ourselves and to adhere to the things that we believe. And so I think there's something along the uh, lines of about 25,000 different denominations. Okay. And there's even <laughs> strong groups of very progressive uh, Christians who would see themselves way more aligning with, with the uh, progressive side of the political spectrum than they would on the right side. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so um, again, I love variety and I think God loves variety. Okay. <laughs> totally. Because, okay. But, but as we think of sort of tr traditional evangelical Christianity, you know, we see this um, dynamic where um, I think that, you know, there is a kind of religious pride that I think is harmful to our faith. And I think that we should be people of conviction, but I think we should always hold conviction with humility. Okay. And, and, and I am absolutely sold out that what I believe is the truth. And Jesus said, you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. I have no qualms about that, you know, and there are certain aspects of ex exclusivity that go with Christianity that are very real and true. Okay. However, I always want to hold that with a heart of humility. First of all, all because I don't know everything. <laughs> and, and, and there may be aspects, I think we may all, you know, get to heaven and realize, wow, we missed it here, we missed it there, we missed it there as well. And so to become reactionary from a Christian standpoint and, and to become volatile and, and condemning of the other, whatever the other is, I think is something that we have to hold very loosely. In mm -hmm. fact, true judgment, we have to reject. Discernment, we need to hold. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be just, you know, kind of, um, you know, all roads get to, to Rome, kind of, you know, just mamby-pamby. I want to be anchored in the, the, the historical faith of Christ. But at the same time, um, I, I think we, I think the, Christ, the Christian world as a whole has a lot to learn about how to be humble and loving. Mm -hmm. And I think if love is the highest definition of God's attributes, in other words, God is love. I mean, it's one of the few places where, where there's a little equation, like a mathematical equation, God equals love, you know, then, um, then we need to understand, like there's, there's one passage I was quoting this morning that says, when Jesus looked upon the multitudes, he was moved with compassion. And that word moved means that his guts were actually churning inside of him. It's a literal 
meaning of the word. And he was moved with compassion because he saw them as weary and scattered, like sheep having no shepherd. Mm -hmm. And then he called his disciples to serve them. Now, if you think of that, Jesus, see, I believe that every man's a sinner and every man needs redemption. But Jesus didn't see them through that eye. He saw them through the eye of their victimization, that they were oppressed, they were weighed down, and they were scattered. And we need to do a lot more seeing people, seeing each other through the eyes of Jesus. Mm -hmm. It's like, hey, all of us are trying hard, but all of us have been victimized, and all of us make huge mistakes and sin, and, and that's, the, you know, that's the picture of humanity. And so we all need grace. We all need love. And so whatever side of the aisle you're on, in whatever circumstance or definition, it's like, wow, can we extend love? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Jesus is a pretty rad dude. I can tell. It's just like, I, like it's, you know, in, like, in, um, like I grew up in, in what I call like a generic American Christian household, you know, that was Christian, but didn't have a Bible and didn't know what it, you know, didn't mean much to us. It was just what our gut handed down you know in a way and we would go to church like every once in a while and right. um and um i went through a moment you know to like of like read you know digging back into that and then and then choosing like it's not necessarily like like i don't necessarily feel ready to like dive into this you know and sure. um but i've always held you know, this man is just a real true hero you know just like a really great great person to have been alive in this world and um so as we're that's my personal story <laughs> like um as we like um you know are, are holding this and you know, of course we have like, these, like, all these examples of you know people being in this this pride of of truth and this condemnation people losing sight of this god his love and you know we have this um and, you know, and I really appreciate the way that you, you know, able to state so clearly, like, you know, I believe in this truth and this is my truth. And, you know, and you're just like, you know, and you, it's very like conviction there. Um, how do we then hold this like pluralistic, you know, country that we live in where there's like all these different folks and um, it's like, how, how do you like hold your truth, your biblical worldview, um, and then continue to relate to this, you know, country or world that has a whole bunch of different things going on. Yeah, no, that's a, such a good question. And I think that, um, let me answer it by giving a little bit of biblical history, if I can. I would love that, you know, yeah. That God set aside a group of people. He appeared to this man named Abraham and his wife, Sarah, and um, they were in a very pagan land called Babylon. And God called them out to go to a new land that he was going to give them. And he said, from your offspring, I will bless the whole world. But in order to bless the whole world, I need to set you aside as a, as a set-apart group of people called the Jews. Mm -hmm. And so the Jew, Jewish tribe began with that kind of call. And then God made them a very exclusive tribe. They weren't supposed to intermarry with anybody. When God gave them the Holy Land, he wanted them to make sure there was no other people. So they exiled all the other people and had war with them. That God wanted this because it was ultimately necessary to have a set apart people. And, that's, and the reason was, is because ultimately they wanted Messiah to have a place to land. <laughs> when God became flesh, that would actually be set apart to him. Okay. But, but what happened was, is they kept disobeying God, and God sent them back into Babylon many years later as captives, okay? So what we have is we have the first system, which was really established by Moses about 500 years after Abraham, that was a legal system designed by God, and it could be called a theocracy. In other words, God was the boss, Right. And interestingly, and we can talk about this later if you want to, but just the way that God set up an economic system with Jubilee and with, with Sabbath was to keep the rich from getting richer. In other words, everything was under God's authority. You know, they had a free market system, but he had correctives in place that kept it from going too crazy. 
all right? That's an interesting thing. But there was also other laws. There was health laws, and then there was moral laws, and so forth. And those laws were maintained very severely. All right. Fast forward, though, to this captivity season. When they were going into captivity, the prophet Jeremiah says, wait a minute, you're going into another land under a different leader. You need to respond differently. See, all the prophets spoke harshly to Israel because they were expected to do what was right. But once they went into Babylon, they didn't expect that out of the government. The government was actually a pluralistic government led by pagans. And so mm -hmm. they said, well, maintain your faith, but don't become polarized from that government. And so you find prophets like Daniel who stood up for his faith very clearly in the scripture. But he also would turn to the king that he was serving and say, live forever, O king. You know, in other words, he, he paid homage to the king even though he lived in a broken world. Mm -hmm, okay. Mm -hmm. So yeah. what, I, what, I, what I surmise by that is that there's two different strategies for two different environments. So I believe that right now we're, we're not in Israel, <laughs> figuratively <laughs> speaking, we're in Babylon. Okay, that, that we're living, as a believer, I say this, I as a believer, I'm living in a land that actually accommodates people of all beliefs. And so therefore I have to make room for them. Now, how do I respond? Well, I think my vote counts. I think I have the right to, to influence others. And if I could win others to my perspective, praise God, <laughs> you know, if I can't, then, then but, but our leadership as, as Christians in this land is a leadership by influence rather than by dominance. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, in Israel, if this was Israel, we would dominate because this is a theocracy, but it's not. Right. And so this is the position I hold. And, and I, th I know that many, I think most, most followers of Jesus would say the same thing, but sometimes their tone is not a tone of influence, but a tone of dominance. Right. And I mm -hmm. think that's what aggravates the whole polarity issue. Wow. Yeah, that makes a lot of, a lot of sense. And, and like, so just to sort of clarify that like in different, in different parts of, of the scripture, there's times when um, the Jews were on their own and they were living in their theocracy. We all have the same God. And so therefore the laws like reflected the belief system or, you know, the, the religious system of the folks. And then, right. and then when they were part of um a government or a, a nation that was had people of all different kinds of faiths, Babylon, that there was a different arrangement. So then it became more of a personal relationship with those laws. And that, of course, the, the, the greater system has its own set of laws. You know? Right. Except for now, we are in what's called a Republican democracy. Right. And so part of our responsibility as good citizens on the earthly plane <laughs> is to participate in that democracy to whatever extent we can on the basis of the worldviews that we hold. Right. So that's exactly. why you see this, this wedding, let's say, of evangelicalism and right-wing politics is because, you know, if you look at the two platforms from a biblical standpoint, one is probably, I mean, neither of them are perfect, <laughs> but one is maybe a third more biblical than the other. Mm -hmm. And so in that division, most evangelicals then will align themselves with a conservative uh, platform. And, and that's really where we get that polarization dynamic with the quote evangelical right mm -hmm, or the mm -hmm. moral majority. You know right. what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And that's, and that's part of the, that's, that feeds the polarity that we have right now. Yeah. I mean, it's really, yeah, um, we're definitely going to come back to the feeding the polarity in a moment. But I, the, the way I would sort of just remembering that, like, you know, the thing that holds us together, and I think in our previous conversation, we talked about, like, the Constitution is, like, the covenant that, like, holds us together here, right? Yes. We, are a, we are in this democracy, and, like, we, by definition, are saying that, you know, we're going to create space for everyone. And just remembering, like, what a democracy is saying is, yes, have your perspective. And put your, you know, chip in the pile, right? Like, you know, like, yeah. and get your, make sure your voice is there. Your voice is important. Like, share that with the world. 
and then remember that you're gonna have to share it a little bit with other folks. And um, I know it seems really helpful. Is it one of the great little examples of democracy that I um, had? I was in a choir, mm -hmm. and we needed to make a choice about whether or not we would be bringing our sheet music with us um, on stage, or mm -hmm. whether or not everyone was gonna have to memorize the songs. You know, <laughs> <laughs> like yeah. And um, someone we had, we we're gonna vote. Right. And someone asked, should I vote based on what my experience is or should I vote on what I think other people need? Yeah. And then, and then the person's like, no, no, no. You vote on your own need here, <laughs> you know? And I thought it was so interesting because it was just like such a good example of like, like your job in a democracy is not to figure out what the majority wants and then support the majority. Like your okay. job in the democracy is to say, here's what I think, and this is where I'm going to put my weight, my little tiny, you know, one millionth little weight, you know, I'm just going to hang it right here. Right. My little ounces are going to go on the scale right here. And, and that's how this works. And, yes. and it's not, obviously we're, it's, there's something about just this like binary like one person wins and one person loses part that's like a right. sloppy and I think is probably not really somehow not sustainable. And I think there's a lot of ways that we can upgrade this system here. <laughs> Listen to my other podcast on transforming democracy to hear more about that. Um, and like, but um, yeah, like there's ways we can do this better right now. Um, but yeah, anyways, I just really appreciate that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and let's pick up this polarization theme. It's, 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 it's so interesting that we're just getting pulled. Like mm -hmm. the, it's worth remembering that like the system is somehow just feeding this, this division. Right. Um, and I'm just like curious, like your thoughts about how do we like, how do we start making bridges here? Right. Well, have you seen the, the documentary social disruption, I think it's called. Mm -mm. the oh, social dilemma you mean oh yeah social dilemma yeah yeah i i I think it seems like i'm the last person in the world not to see it but um yeah i don't actually have netflix so i need to figure out how to get a hold of that yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah just get the free trial <laughs> watch right. it and, and then resign totally but, yeah. um, but you know i think what they're seeing in the social media world is just sort of a microcosm of what's going on in the bigger world is yeah. that is that um Obviously, there's a number of factors that are driving the polarization and fueling it. Um, one, I think, really is media and the news cycle. And we just, you know, um, if, if things were not as extreme on that level, where basically, you know, you have Fox News on the one hand and you have all the other mainstream media on the other hand, and, you know, some hate Trump and on the other hand, you know, uh, there's, it's just, it's just a crazy time, but each, each group becomes an echo chamber and each mm -hmm. group makes its money off of listeners or viewers that are, uh, wanting to hear more that will excite them more. It becomes almost an addictive pattern in people's lives to become part of the po polarized sides. And so I think, I think that's probably one key issue. Now, again, the reforms that they're thinking of that they propose in the Social Dilemma uh, uh, documentary, I think are radical, but I think they're probably needed. And I think that if we saw similar reforms on the right and the left media, uh, that, and, and, and obviously I, I'm a person who believes in personal rights, and I also believe in free market, and so I don't think they should necessarily be mandated by the government, but I think that we could you know, hold councils and have influence talks that actually say, hey, you guys, we're driving humanity in our country down the wrong road. And, uh, yeah. and so I think that one factor would probably take care of maybe 25% of the polarization dynamics, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think also, I think that there is, um, so if we, if we were able to bring some reform there, I think also if we, if we were able to come together and agree on certain things that are clear. Mm -hmm. In other words, if you actually get down to it, I don't know a single conservative who doesn't love the environment. And I don't know a single progressive 
who believes in climate change problems, who doesn't love business and wants to see our country prosper. You know what I mean? It's like, it's, it's only the fringe elements that are at war with each other. And most of us actually have a lot of common ground on a scale of one to 10. It may be a, a two and a four, you know, <laughs> or a three and a five. It's like, we're that close together. You know, I don't I, like the abortion issue. I don't know anybody who believes killing life is, is right. You know, but also we deal with the issues of women's rights. And so if we could have that conversation, you know, and on the other hand, uh, you know, the passion that's, that's in most pro-life people is based in their convictions about the nature of God and the, and the heart of God. And, and, and uh, that's why they're passionate about that. I don't know anybody who doesn't feel like the foster system's broken and we shouldn't be doing more adoption. Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know anybody in the world except maybe a pimp who believes that sex slavery is a good thing. You know, <laughs> in other right. words, or, or imprisoning, uh, you know, uh, blacks for, uh, you know, victimless crime kind of, uh, you know, those kind of, I mean, all of that, I think all of us hate police brutality, you know? Yeah, yeah. Like, um, so I think we're actually way more closer than we realize. Yes. And that's what I think is the problem is, is that we, because the, um, you know, there's spiritual forces at work that I believe want to create chaos. And I believe that they want to divide us. And I believe that at and and I believe that media is happy to play along. And um, and unfortunately, that's I think what has led us down this road. I mean, I'm sure I'm not being exhaustive in terms of all the factors that are fueling this, but but I do believe that if there were people like you, Duncan, who are trying to build conversations across the aisle, you know, and begin to hear each other's perspectives, I think that that this is a huge effort on your part to make that difference. And so I, I really want to honor you and congratulate you on this. Yeah. Well, thank you. And um, yeah, yeah. I was going to say like, you're talking my talk here, but yeah, you get it. Um, yeah. And you know, it's really, I mean, I just gone to watch the series of um, two debates that just happened, the, the presidential debate and the vice presidential debate and Oh boy. Um, and they were disappointing, you know, in various ways. Um, uh, people avoiding questions or people just not even talking about them or just like people being right. just bickering, interrupting. I really yeah. felt like people like wrangling children, you know, like, you know, kindergartners there for a minute <laughs> there. And, um, yes. uh, but the thing that gets me is like just the fact that we're trying to have debate about these issues. Each one of those questions is so profound you know like what is our relationship to china like how do we heal from the coronavirus like what do we want to do what is a good tax system and to have this be like should we do this one answer or should we do this other one answer or is this person right or is this person wrong it's just like right. such an inadequate conversation that like each of those could really merit from like a group a, a council of citizens you know of like you know 20 people just like mm -hmm. doing like in-depth conversation i mean i would just love to see like a dialogue happening about like how as a country do we want to relate to china how as a country do we want to heal from the coronavirus like how as a country do we want to reconcile our history with race and racism and slavery you know and like and with an intention to come to some sort of consensus and what's amazing is we have the tools to have these kinds of conversations um, and, but then as you say, like, I mean, the system is like, obviously like trying to get us to be debating with each other. And then there's people making money off of that. And then there's people, and then there's, you know, and of course the, when the profit motive gets in there and the divisiveness is, gets fed into it, but it's like, but then there's this other piece. And I think this is where you mentioned is kind of like this like spiritual division here. That's like, there's like, it's getting into a place where like something's like actually making us afraid of each other. Yes. Like, it's not just that we want to need to have this conversation, but we're actually afraid of each other. Right. And that's. Yeah. Um, we'll see again, hmm. another worldview point is that I actually believe that there are unseen supernatural forces that are working in the universe. 
and mm -hmm. that many of them are actually aligned with God, but some of them rebelled against God. And that's where we get yeah. the word Satan um, and Lucifer. Um, and so that's really part of my worldview. And I have very experiential evidence of those things being real. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, but I also believe that they have a purpose and their purpose is to undermine the goodwill of God for humanity. And so they don't, they don't mind if you're extreme right or extreme left. They're just happy to have you so wound up in your attitude mm -hmm. that you're unable to, to uh, produce the fruit of God in this world. Okay. Yeah. And so they, they, you know, I, I don't think the devil cares, you know? Um, right. And so again, I think that um, in fact, at a, at a particular point in, in the biblical writings, he's called the accuser of the brethren. In other mm -hmm. words, he accuses us to one another and he accuses us to God all day and night, the scripture says. And so that accusational right. dynamic, we would see as, as sort of inherently demonic. Okay. Yeah. We'll get yeah. In that place of judgment. And that's, I think, partly why Jesus forbid judging one another. He said, judge not lest you be judged. That ultimately, and, and this is the issue about unforgiveness, which you mentioned earlier, is that unforgiveness You've heard it said that unforgiveness is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, it really is because forgiveness is not just something we do for the sake of the other person. Forgiveness is something we do for our own sake. Because as long as we hold unforgiveness, we are actually harming ourselves. So Antifa, yeah. on the yeah. one hand, is being harmed by their anger at the system, and then the, the right-wing people are, are, are harmed with their hatred of, of the protests and, some, in some cases, the riots and so forth. It's like, come on, you guys. We've, you know, this is really contrary to the basic message. It's, it's more in line with the enemy's purpose, with the devil's purpose, than it is with God's purpose. Yeah. Wow. Not really... So there's I think something really clicking here for me that's like right and somehow I've got a fun parallel here in my head but like like you know what right like what would the devil like if it's trying to undermine God's purpose would like what what would be more successful way to do that than to have faithful you know Christians be acting against God's purpose right yeah. you know, right and Absolutely. um and to have and to sort of and to fuel like hey but here's some really bad people on this other on the left or your whatever your gays and you know all these other folks like you gotta go get them and you know and, and feeding that and then i'm just right now just picturing though like that's also what we know that russia china iran as they're trying to undermine our democracy right. like that is exactly their strategy also right. like they don't really care who wins they just exactly. want americans to be fighting with each other yeah. you know and um and you know i actually saw other i think it was like jimmy fallon i was like watching like the response to like the, the that first presidential debate which again yeah. wow um and he was like he's like you know what no one like that except for one person and it was Vladimir Putin with a cat on his lap, petting it going, yes, yes, yes. You know, and that's, you know, like we can try to say like, get everyone just like blaming each other. Like, Hey, everyone, we are, this is the devil's work or this is Putin's work, you know, like whatever, whatever we want. You know, it's like, it's like us trying to rip apart and trying to accuse each other of like not being righteous enough is, um that's yeah. exactly taking us away from love and that's not to say that either conviction is wrong in other words like if yeah, you think right. of <laughs> climate change or you think of ending systemic racism to whatever extent it still exists in our culture those are righteous causes yeah and they need to be we need to be passionate about those causes the same thing on the other side of the equation you know, to stop the chaos in the land and just, you know, all of the economic issues that feel threatened on the right side and the abortion issue and, you know, all those things, they're righteous causes in my estimation on both sides. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't fault somebody for being passionate mm -hmm, mm -hmm, in their perspective. 
because yeah. that because the alternative is just becoming passive and you know digging our heads into the sand and i don't want that either right you know? yeah. so can we can we validate passion without promoting polarization mm -hmm. exactly yeah well, i'm gonna just like pull a, again from one of the a recent episode with um david brubaker who wrote the book um uh when the center does not hold leading in times of uh um, polarization and his take home and i'm just going to keep on hammering at this one because i want the whole world to hear it is affirm your own dignity affirm the dignity of the other person speak your truth and then keep the connection mm -hmm. right and it's just like have your conviction and then just remembering that both of you are humans in relationship with each other preserve the relationship you know and um I think in that spirit, I would love to try to see what might be like to lessons from like what are what are some lessons that we can come up with here about like how a conservative might speak to someone who's progressive, you know, about their values or about the world, um, and and then how might what might be some strategies for progressives to speak to conservatives, you know, as you as someone who's like across this, you know, been in both worlds very much, you know, deeply. Um, I wonder what you, if you have any insights on just like, how can we relate to each other? Well, I think one thing is to make sure that as we communicate, we're communicating always the why and not just the what. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's straight out of like conflict resolution. You know, the strategy exactly. is where we get into trouble. The deep human needs, we can relate to those, yeah. Yeah. So the why, let's say, the reason I am pro-life adamantly, and I will always vote pro-life, is, is a pretty significant why. So I believe that, you know, we will wake up as we get our technology better to see life in the womb, we will wake up 15 years later and realize that this is almost a parallel to what happened in, during the slavery issue, in my, in my estimation that you know people were excusing slavery back in those days because it was convenient because it was you know everybody's going to have a slave it's it, the econo economy depends on it what a horrible set of excuses i think we're going to realize now that women's rights are absolutely essential but there's an actual human being there that needs to be protected okay so i mean that that one issue so why why do you believe that well, this is why I believe. So when I sit down with friends of mine that are actually not pro-life, they're pro-choice, they say, well, we don't approve of the killing of a baby in a womb, but we also feel like women have been kept captive to uh, sort of the, the economy of our day through these problems. And we believe that this is a right exchange of rights. Okay, well, um, okay, now that I understand why, I still don't agree with you. I still believe it's wrong. And I still personally hold a moral code that says, well, you know, we have to be, you know, I, I was part of the sexual revolution, but I don't agree with it anymore. I believe the sexual revolution was actually harmful to humanity. I believe the divorce rate went up and I believe that most children are born in fractured homes, therefore, and most children now are living with lifelong wounds in their, in their, their, their relationships because they weren't raised as God had originally intended. Okay. Mm -hmm. So again, I hold this whole, like it's, again, it's a worldview. So please understand me. I'm not, I'm not trying to preach at you, but, but at the same time, if you understand why I hold such a strong conviction about just both sexuality issues, gender issues, and, and the uh, issue of abortion, which really was to try to bring equality to the sexes mm -hmm. at least initially, it did give permission to a set of lifestyle choices that actually harmed the family and therefore harm the next generation and the generation after. Okay, so for me, again, I hold this as my why. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and, and if you can see that, and you can say, okay, well, if I, if I believe that, I would probably hold the same position. And that's why I would say, hey, if there's no God in the universe, abortion makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, seriously, I can say that yeah. honestly. You know, if there's no God in the universe, it, it is the sensical thing to do. You know? Yeah, in like but, certain circumstances, you totally. Yeah. Yeah. So, but I hold a different perspective. And so again, if we can if we can get down to the why, 
Yeah. If I understand their why correctly, I would I would agree with it if there's no God. Yeah. You know? Yeah, that's just really good. I mean, um, I mean, one, because it is like it basically in you know, in in conflict resolution or mediation or conflict transformation, like what we talk about is the iceberg of conflict, right? And it's like yeah. what's sticking out of the top above the water is like what we usually are fighting about. But it's yeah. actually what's below the water where things are crunching into each other, right? And oh, right. and there's more there. And yeah. so the secret is like, let's get under the surface and find out what's really going on. Like, why does this matter to you? Like, what what makes this important, you know? And and I say, like, conflict is this opportunity to thrive because every time you're in conflict with someone, it means you have a line straight into something really deep in their heart. Yes. You know? you're like touching onto something that they care about deeply. And if you can show that that, whatever that is, is going to be safe and you're going to take care of it and respect it and honor it and trust the sincerity of it, you know, then, um, then you have this amazing opportunity to connect about something that's really profound for both of you. And what's generally kind of like the general thing is like when we get down to those underlying needs, usually we can see something that we understand, right? Um, so exactly. So we're focusing on the what about like, you know, talking about the nuances of abortion, for example, right. you know, and you know, like what trimester or what, whatever, right. under what conditions, you know, like you can lose yourself in all of those details, but do we agree that life matters? And now we're like, yeah, right. Well, we're on the same page about that, you know? And okay. So there we can start having this conversation and, and, but what I appreciate this also is that there's a way some, this comes back to something you were mentioning earlier about like us, like coming to um, like, what is the common ground? Like in our discourse, like what is the thing that we can actually hold here together, you right. know? And, um, and the woman, Mickey Cashton, who does nonviolent communication here in the Bay area, she started, she has this model and I don't have to I'll put resources for this on the website, but yeah. um, she talks about it, the highest common denominator, you know, it's like, what is something that we can agree on? You know, like, obviously we can get down to like, do we care about life or do we care right. about, you know, right. like, th there's some deep ground things that are obvious, but like, what are some things that we can agree on there? And then how do we build around that? And that becomes mm -hmm. the seed of these kinds of conversations. Yeah. Um, but just taking the time to say why. And then one of the best questions that I've learned about how to get to that why is um, tell me a story about your life that will mm -hmm. help me understand why you believe what you do. Oh, that's so good. Because everyone has an answer to that question that's totally yes. true and it reveals their humanity, you know? Yes. And see, that's one of the things, again, that we have to kind of look at. I mean, that's why I generally tend, like, I don't mind protests. I think they're fine. Obviously, I'm horribly against uh, looting and, and uh, you know, violence and, and rioting. Um, but the issue is, is that, you know, many of the facts that have come out about some of the different examples that we have of pre police brutality weren't the whole picture. Like the initial video was not the whole picture of what all happened. And mm -hmm. even the most recent uh, discoveries around the, si the situation of Breonna Taylor, obviously her death is absolutely tragic, but was it a travesty, you know? And, and, and now that other facts come out or, you know, the, the grand jury had its day and it, it did its research and came up with its particular focus, okay? Are we still horribly, uh, uh, grieve that she was killed absolutely and and i i don't mind a civil uh you know uh gift of of 12 million dollars being given to their family you know praise god okay right but but my point is it's just that living together in a country where we expected that there would be division of opinions mm -hmm. We tried, uh, our forefathers tried to erect the best possible system for resolving conflict. Yeah. And exactly. it's pretty good. I mean, it's not excellent, <laughs> mm -hmm. but it's pretty doggone good. You know, separating the executive from the, from the, uh, you know, the legislative, from the judicial. I mean, that was brilliant. 
I mean, all these things. I mean, if you think about 1,200 years ago, or no, 800 years ago, the Magna Carta was written. I mean, it's like, come on, like that was the first major advance in individual human rights. Yeah. You know, I mean, it wasn't that long ago in human history. And then 400 years after that, they came up with this document that was just so compelling and a system that would actually, and even the fact, you know, I know there's a lot of debate about the electoral college uh, since the election of Trump, you know, because Hillary got the majority vote. But the reason that is, is so that every state would be represented. Mm -hmm. So we vote by states, not by popular vote. You know, so again, because otherwise California and New York would win every election, you know what I mean? And the whole middle of the country would be unrepresented. So again, these systems are great and they obviously could stand some improvement. But, but my point is, is that at the end of the day to remove polarity, because that's the point we're on, is we all need to be able to respect the outcomes. Yeah. And so, you know, when Obama was elected, the only reason I wanted to vote for him was because he was black. His policies, I didn't like at all. Okay. But I like the fact that a black president is coming into our country. That was awesome. You know, that was great for me. Um, but I was, I was as disappointed as I expected to be by many of the policy decisions he made throughout his, his tenure. You know what I mean? Again, mm -hmm. as a, you know, biblical worldview-based voter, I, I, I didn't like many of his decisions. Okay. Now, again, but I respected it and I prayed for Obama and I, I wanted him to succeed. Okay. Yeah. And, and, uh, and obviously I think Trump on the other hand was a reaction to the Obama era that, mm -hmm. that the right wing people felt so underrepresented and so underserved by the Obama administration that they just chose the most, you know, outrageous person <laughs> to, yeah. to be the president. Outrageous yet, might be the best single word there. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and, and so obviously there was some resistance on the right to Obama. I mean, politically, yes, a lot. And, and then there's just been the exact opposite. And that's where you see the hypocrisy of the political system coming out because, you know, the people who condemned it before are now in favor of it. the people who are in favor of it are now condemning the other. Mm -hmm, you know? mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But, but my responsibility, if Biden wins this year, <laughs> or, you know, I know this is probably airing after the elections finalized. So, um, is that I want to do my best to support that leader. Yeah. You know, there's a, there's a passage of scripture that talks about supporting leaders where, where Paul is speaking to the Roman church. And this was during the time of Nero. Mm, the persecution wow. against Christians was deadly. And he said, you know, we need to do our best to honor the leaders of our land. And I think that holds true in our culture because we made a decision. Made, you know, we're going to influence as much as we can and may the best man win or the best woman, hopefully. And so, so we, the, you know, and, and I think that that's where we have to, if we are real patriots, you know, in other words, not nationalists in the extreme sense of the word, but if we really love our country and we understand that the Constitution is probably, especially having it written 250 years ago or whatever it is, is one of the most evolutionary advances in humanity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It may have ever, even though we, we failed to walk it out as it related to slavery and other issues and Native Americans, uh, and those are tragic failures on our part as a nation. But, but still, it still serves to correct us again and again and again. Anyway, yeah. that's just a thought about that. No, I I, helpful. Super helpful. I mean, and then there's, a, I, I feel like coming, you know, full circle, you know, like being, even with the greatness of this document, remembering that we are imperfect people making imperfect systems, that, like, can we have the grace to look at, like, the ways that it's like not perfect and then it's in, and you know there's things happening in 2020 that the founding fathers like didn't quite um anticipate you know i don't think yeah. they pictured the media being like it is i don't think that they ever pictured you know just like they didn't really think that there were going to be political parties that wasn't something that they really hoped that was going to happen i mean they had some idea yeah. of it it happened really quickly but they were kind of like they didn't want that to happen you know and so um 
you know, I don't think they expected the Supreme Court to become such a um, political, you know, yeah. entity, you know, they really were hoping that would be an interesting check, you know, so great, we got some work to do. That's great, people. But and I, the, when it comes to something I keep on thinking about is like, I, can this, can the common ground that we can rally around, can we just say, can we all agree that we want this country to be as functioning as well as possible, honoring as many people as possible, all of us having as good of lives as possible, and really trying to be a positive influence in the world and a place that we can hope will be a good place for our children to live in and our grandchildren. And can we, you know, continue a path of, of doing good in the world and doing good for ourselves? Like, yeah. I think that we can all agree on that. I mean, I don't yeah. know. I mean, I'm like, I, I know that there are some people in here like just let's smash it all, and I, and, and that's fair. But like, it's not a lot of them. Um, and so, yeah, could we just like rally around that, and then we get to get into the nuance conversation about how we do it. And the nuance feels like a really key thing here, you know. Yeah. And that is like, I think the one thing we have to realize is that any community, and even a national community is an ecosystem made up of a thousand secondary items that live in balance and relationship to one another. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and either that val balance is chaotic and violent as it has been in the earth at various times, if you talk about sort of a, a natural ecosystem. But again, you know, if you, if you remove the wolves that were attacking your sheep, you're going to have an over grazing problem with the deer that will actually create landslides that will actually erode the, you know, in other words, everything is intertwined. We are all connected to one another, whether we like it or not. Right. And that's where we have to understand that our ability to have a functioning ecosystem, a self-sustaining, um, let's call it synergistic ecosystem, requires a greater degree of, of community and communication. And it, it requires that we do our best to eliminate the violent responses from either side or the vociferous responses that actually create more chaos in the ecosystem than create balance. Yeah, yeah, uh, totally. I really appreciate, yeah, I mean, the ecosystem is really good. and. I think I'm flashing to, I think Daniel Quinn talks about this idea that like nature doesn't try to conquer itself, you know, like animals are eating animals, plants are crawling on top of other plants and trying to fight for the sunlight. And, you know, that's a natural thing that's happening, but they're right. never trying to wipe each other out. And, and that's, you know, that's where we kind of get off, off track. Um, I, uh, I wanted to start landing the plane here, but there's something that I wanted to make sure I capture here because it's something that's really a passion for your, yours. Yeah. And like in your work, um, you um, are a coach and support for people who are finding their calling and starting their own ministry. And I'm curious um, <clears throat> and just like, and you know, specifically like for people who are starting churches and, and finding ministry in their own lives um but i'm curious if you have some maybe you know advice or thoughts or to, to you know like maybe some generic wisdom about people finding their own calling and their own passion um and um yeah wherever you want to take that i just really appreciate some of sure. your perspective on that sure well again from a biblical worldview standpoint i'll start there and then i'll, I'll broaden it out Sweet. You know, I really believe that the first step in really discovering your true calling in life is to discover the one who made you and to start building a personal relationship with God. And what mine, mine began with just a simple prayer, God, if you're real, make yourself real to me. And I started having more and more amazing revelation of who God was. And it took me about a, a year and a half before I started reading the Bible, but but that also assisted me because I started to see, and again, I, I, have, I hold the perspective the Bible is inspired and that it is authoritative. And so, um, you know, I was 
but it's it's and but it's written over 1500 years by a slew of different writers and uh and it just holds together so well okay um and uh and it really it's centered around the person of jesus and that's that's i'll, I'll stop with that but that's that's sort of the center point where i feel like if you know your creator you know the reason why you're created some mm -hmm. wise man once said the two most important days in your life is the day you're born and the day you find out why. And see, I believe there's an incredible intentionality in the universe. And I believe that we call it God's will. Um, your, your kingdom come, your will be done. And I really believe that God has a will, not just for humanity in general, but for each individual human. Okay, so then when we're, when we're coaching somebody, we'll look at their history and see the weavings of God in their life throughout their, their, their life story. So I'll get into their birth story and their conception story even. Like even if it was, I've, I've coached people that were the product of a rape, mm -hmm. okay? And yet God was meeting them in a powerful way, okay? So then I'll look at the formative experiences of their life, both the positive and the negative because all of them have fingerprints of God's because God knows us before we knew him. And so there's this process. And then, and then I'll look at their, their, uh, the point at which they really connected to God for the first time. See, all of these are like little clues to me of their destiny. And then I'll, uh, I'll go, we have actually online a series of gift discovery tools where they're actually simple questions that people can fill out. that give you an approximate understanding of your God given gifting. And then we talk about passions. What are the passions of your heart? So each of these things is part of the discovery purpose. And then finally, we end up at the idea of dreams. Like if you had no limitations of time, energy, or money, and you could not possibly fail, what would you want to do for God to make this world a better place? Mm -hmm. What would you want to do? And just try to start with that as the point on the horizon. And then we help the person build a life map. And the life map is just a series of junctures. You know, if you're traveling from San Francisco to New York, you know, you plan your journey. And, uh, and we want to help them plan their journey. And then we'll look at the growth goals, the sabotage points that might hinder them, the detours and the roadblocks. And most of that's internal. You know, most yeah. <laughs> people have stuff inside, you know, pain and wounds and, and issues of kind of will rebellion stuff that they they don't want to comply with whatever seems to be happening and uh, we have self-destruct mechanisms in our lives you know and so um, uh, many of us have a fear of failure a lot of us have a fear of success mm -hmm. and so we we sabotage and so we want to identify those and turn them into growth goals that people can begin to set and then and then we finally encourage you to uh to attract a mentor. And sometimes that can be a peer mentor, but sometimes it's better to have somebody that's been down the road or farther than you are. And so, uh, but if you have that, and then if, you, if you're married, you have a spouse that's walking this through with you. If you have, let's say a circle of friends that they can also know your, your destiny uh, goals and your, and your life map, and they can support you on the journey. So that each of these things are, are really, because I, I, I believe that there's no greater purpose in life. And I believe that a person will never be as fulfilled in life than when they're fulfilling the exact purpose for which they were created. Mm -hmm. wow. and so that yeah. could be that you're, you're, you're uh, ending sex trafficking in Thailand, or you're doing an orphanage in, in Guatemala, or you're, or you're uh, starting a, a music group that's going to bless people or you're building a business that's going to give a percentage to the poor or you're you know it's like whatever it is that god's given you you're planning a church or you're you know you're a stay-at-home mom even if you want to be or stay-at-home dad you know um because pouring your life into your own children is one of the greatest things you could ever do you know so again finding those destiny dynamics and then, and there's there's a bunch of sub points there, but that's that's the overview. Uh, I I really um, you know, I really appreciate that, and um, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I I feel touched by it myself. You know, just like hearing this, you know, like I, um, you know, I can think about 
yeah, like the place, like my birth story and my like childhood and then connecting and knowing when I had found my calling and then, um, you know, and, uh, and recognizing the self-sabotage and the fear of success and the fear of failure and, and, um, yeah. Um, I heard someone say, you know, it's like, until you found something that's like authentically your voice, you kind of haven't even lived yet. You know, it's like, you're just an echoing things out and that's cool. You know, like it's a, there's a lot, a lot of learning we go through in life before we get to find our, our voice, you know, but then there's something really powerful. And I would just, it was like kind of a recurring like joke theme in this, in this podcast about like, it's like we're getting close to like what the solution is here, you mm-hmm. know, you know, especially like in a democracy, you know, where we're all out here trying to find our voice. It's like, find your voice, find your calling. What is the world that you want to build? What is the dream that you have? Mm-hmm. Do that. Yes. And if we all are doing that, yeah, we're building the world we want to live in everyone. Like that's how it happens. You know? Yeah. 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 That's totally right on. Um, Michael, there's a, um, a question that I ask all the guests on the show and it's, you know, given your life experience, um, and micro and in this world, um, what is something that you might invite people to pay attention to as they're trying to make a better world for themselves and the rest of the world? In- internally or externally, what would they pay attention to? Yeah, I mean, I guess I say pay attention to, because, you know, like people get to do whatever they want, but like, you know, like, yeah, what, like, that's interesting. I guess I kind of keep it open-ended there, you know, like, but I, I would say like something in your own life that you need, that you, that like, you think that people would be useful to notice or something that's going on around them that might be useful for them to notice, you know? Yeah. Um, probably one thing that comes to mind is just learning to process your pain correctly because mm-hmm. life is painful. And uh, Jesus said, in this world, you're going to have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. And most people, Christian or non-Christian that I know, have a difficult time processing pain correctly and really finding the purpose of God in their pain, because pain always needs a purpose. And if you can find the purpose, and usually the purpose is personal transformation. But the problem with most humans is that we either, on the one hand, become victims and begin to embrace a victim mentality. And out of that victim mentality, we can get sucked into the hole of, of uh, self-pity. Mm-hmm. And, uh, or on the other hand, we become a victimizer mm-hmm. <laughs> in our pain. So either a victim or a victimizer the victimizer basically internalizes their pain and it becomes frustration, anger, and eventually rage, and they end up harming other people and feeling like they have a right to harm people in the name of their, their own opinion or, or, or situation. And I think that either side is a mistake. And yeah. I would call it a sin. Either side is a sin. But I think if you can maintain that center place where you keep your heart tender, and where you appeal to God as the one who didn't ordain the pain, but is the one who is with you in the pain. Okay. And you're able to process and just say, okay, guide me through this. You know, the Psalm 23 is such an amazing song. Even through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me. And your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Um, you prepare a table in front of my enemies and my cup runs over. I mean, that incredible statement that God makes or that's made on behalf of God is this, this, if you process your pain correctly, you will have the most effective, efficient movement towards personal growth and become the person ultimately that has the least amount of baggage and the highest amount of potential to fulfill God's purpose in your life. Yeah. Well, I really, 
appreciate that. That's really, really good wisdom there. Um, you know, one of the things that, you know, it's like so many of the problems we have in this world is this trauma, you know, it's hurt, it's pain, you know, and, um, and in the, in that begin with David Brubaker, where we talked about polarization, he has this, um, uh, this chart created by Strategies for Trauma and Awareness and Resilience, which is part of Eastern Mennonite mm -hmm. University. And they have this thing that's called the cycles of violence. And, and basically like a traumatic event happens and then people will go through a victim cycle, right? And they'll either just get stuck in a victim cycle or they'll spin over into a aggressor cycle, mm -hmm. you know, and um, which then of course creates more pain. And then other people get pulled into the cycle, right? And it just, you can imagine that's just echoing out and echoing out. Um, and then they also have another, um, the model of like, how do you, how do you move out of it? Sure. And um, yeah, and this is something I think I said way at the beginning. This is like one of the real, um, uh, I mean, I think the benefits of having a biblical worldview at this time or in life um, and um, I know this is also something that people find in like a 12 step process, mm, just yeah. like handing it over. Sure. You know, um, I know that in the 12 step process, there's this idea that like, you're not the director of this show. Yeah. Like you're not like, you don't get to control all the shots and all the lighting and all the ways and all the actors like, like, they're, like uh -huh. that's not in your hands and you just get to do your part. And, um, and like you get to, I mean, as much as it sucks, like you're going to have to work through your own pain on your own, but not necessarily on your own, you know, and that like that, That's right. the, whether it's, whether it's God or the universe or wh whatever right. you want or the earth, I mean, just like give that to the earth, you know, yeah. like, you know, just like whatever you need, like, but that's our that's our gift to the world and to ourselves is to like not carry the pain not let us hold us back and not give it to other people yeah and along those lines i think most people i know even people who claim the lordship of christ in their life they are still the sun in their own solar system yep <laughs> and i think everything revolves around them and jesus is just one of the planets Okay, yeah. I think when we actually put, and again, obviously I'm speaking from a biblical worldview, when Jesus becomes the sun in our solar system and we relegate ourselves to being one of the planets, that's where, you know, life begins to shift. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there's a, there's a scripture that says, Jesus said this in the Sermon on the Mount, which I recommend every person to read, even if you don't you know, follow Christianity at all. The Sermon on the Mount is, in, is like the, the Constitution, but it's even 10 times better. Um, but it, he basically said, you know, seek first and foremost the kingdom of heaven and God's righteousness, and then everything else will be added to you. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a matter of priorities there. So. Yeah. Yeah. Again, it's 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 key. Yeah. So if you just need a reference, it's it's actually in Matthew chapter five that the Sermon on the Mount begins with the amazing statement, Blessed are the poor, for the kingdom of God is theirs, you know. And um anyway, but <clears throat> I appreciate that. Uh, it's so good to talk to you though. This is great. Um and I'll um I'll make sure that that that, that we I, we get that up on the the Factor Friends page for this episode, um, so people can find the Sermon on the Mount there. If they don't have to have a Bible on hand, um, yeah. uh, Michael, if people want to find out more about you and your work and get in contact, how how can they do that? Yeah, well, there's I have two websites that you're welcome to check out. One is called PastorsCoach.com, and the other one is um, DestinyFinder.com. They are mo monetized, but I don't receive any money from those sites. At least not yet. <laughs> Hopefully I will. Um, but also um, michaelbroder.com is another source for me. And then, uh, you know, I'm on social media as well. So I'm on face, Facebook and, and Instagram. And, uh, and again, you know, um, 
my audience is mostly Christian. So if you're not, please don't be offended if you see some Christian stuff there that is more intense. Um, <laughs> it's, again, you know, I'm, I, I really do consider myself, though, a reconciler and a bridge builder. You know, I'm not very excited about building any walls. <laughs> right. And so um, I want to build bridges instead. Yeah. So, yeah, so feel free to reach out and uh, you can private message me like on Facebook or whatever. And that'd be great. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, I just want to really thank you for um, just like your capacity to to stand here, or, you know, sit here, be here in your truth and just like just fully conviction and then still holding that open heart. And I'm just like really appreciating that um, that lesson that you learned so long ago and to see you um, living it. And it's, it feels great. Thank you. And I just want to commend you as well, Duncan. I feel like you're doing an amazing work here with, with uh, having these different talks and making this happen. So bless you. Thank you.